Now, if you love PowerPoint and you're addicted to PowerPoint and you can't save yourself from PowerPoint, then use PowerPoint. Otherwise, don't use PowerPoint. In this video, I will discuss how organizations use tools to improve team efficiency and manage project data, such as requirements, design, and test cases. Please click below to subscribe for future videos. So firstly, let me describe a problem that I see in organizations. That is that they do projects and they create documentation, such as requirements, specs, user stories, designs, test cases. But unless they have a good way to manage that data, it can get all over the place and be difficult to track and share and keep up to date. So a situation like this kind of occurs in the organization. Now, over the last 20 years or so, people have typically used things like spreadsheets, slides like PowerPoint and text documents like Word uh, to store their artifacts. And these do work fine, but you have to be very organized. We're going to label things correctly, have a common location, uh, revision them correctly, um, and uh, make sure they are accessible by the right people across the network. And when you when teams then attach to that as an email, uh, the attachments become different versions and there's another copy. So it is a very fragile system. So it works. And if you have a small team and you're well organized, uh, you can do that. But as soon as you get a bigger team, more complicated, more moving parts, more revisions, etc., uh, this can really kind of break down. Now, I'm going to go through six examples of where to use tools to improve efficiency of a team. So the first example I'm going to discuss are process documents. Typically, teams that are process mature will have a definition of how they do their work so they can repeat that, study it, improve it, and not going to slip backwards and lose their gains. And they may be defining how they do agile, how they do waterfall, how they do project management or test or requirements, etc. So when they have really figured out how to do something well, they will write it down. Now, a way to write that down is a big tome, a big fat document, and these typically are done, but they're difficult to read, difficult to find, difficult to navigate, etc. So the first thing I'd recommend, well, I've seen people do it that I'd recommend, is to build short checklists of how these practices are supposed to be done. So if I want to kind of do Agile, maybe there's a short definition of how to do Agile. Or if I want to kind of learn how to do or repeat correctly how to do testing activities in a, in a team, I may go to the testing checklist and take a look. Now, those checklists can then be put into a Confluence page or a Wiki page, and the checklist can then be utilized or referred to very quickly uh, as the developer or the team member kind of works. They don't have to go to a separate large document. They can click on the link and find how to do requirements or how to do a backlog or how to do testing uh, very quickly. Now, one step above that is to then make these into maybe SharePoint pages that are fillable templates. So maybe there's a set of steps we go through. Maybe one of these checklists is the set of steps, one, two, three, four, etc. And when you pose a question to the person on the team, like what are the milestones or what are the issues or what are the risks, uh, that the template could be a wiki page or a SharePoint page or a Confluence page, and they're typing in the results into the page. So now the checklist becomes a page, a fillable template uh, that can be then be stored and kind of navigated and found uh, later on. Now, another example I've seen is Google Forms, uh, where typically the questions or the steps of the checklist are presented as questions to the team members and they have to respond like, have you assessed risk? Have you mitigated risk? Have you done estimation, for example? And they can then use the form to kind of fill out that data. And then the form is kind of stored in the Google system. And so again, they're taking the, the best practices typically done in Word beforehand and then put those in neat little checklists and questionnaires and forms uh, throughout the flow of their kind of work. So the second type of information I see people put into the tools are things like estimates, requirements, and plans. Again, these have historically lent themselves to be uh, put into like Word documents and PowerPoint and Excel, but they can, can become very cumbersome, again, difficult to share, uh, particularly if you're doing attachments and things like that. Even things like uh, share drives uh, like Excel uh, can be cumbersome and error prone to kind of modify and tweak. And so uh, the tools nowadays typically lend themselves well to uh, capturing that kind of data. Uh, this is a picture like of a rally 
uh, tool, uh, similar to kind of version one or Jira. Uh, they have fields for estimates and tasks breakdown. Again, so the idea is to kind of put the data in there so you have a, a close place to kind of find it. And if it's just one piece changes, you can change that one piece uh, correctly or easily and kind of find it. And then things like requirements. Again, Word documents do work okay with that up to maybe a couple of hundred requirements, then it becomes very cumbersome. And so there are things like a Jira backlogs that are a very rudimentary uh, way to kind of do this. You may find Jira or a Confluence page is adequate for that purpose. If it gets more cumbersome than that, or um, more detailed than that, uh, you can look at some of the plugins. There's like R4J uh, plugin to Jira. Uh, often people may, uh, use tools like Jammer. So the Jammer will be a tool to store requirements in, and then we kind of refer back to the Jira uh, for the task breakdown, or they may even put requirements in a Confluence page that they can be kind of shared and managed. And maybe if they put requirements over there, they then use the Jira task list here uh, for the to-dos. So there are different combinations of how to then uh, distribute the work between a task list in a Jira and the requirements in another tool, either a special tool, a plugin, or like a Confluence. Now, the other example I've seen people uh, do actually very well uh, project plans. Typically, these have been put into Word documents or even PowerPoint. And again, they can become very large and cumbersome and difficult to update and modify and share. So the best I've seen is where people put the same data into like a wiki page or a Confluence page. So imagine this be a web page in your tool of choice. And the beginning of the page kind of says the scope, add a scope, customers, and these other sections just here. And then you can either share it, protect it, modify it, uh, manage change into it, export it if you need to, if you have to give it, give it to somebody else. It may be even given a customer access to the link, so you don't have to do uh, attachments or exporting. Uh, they just have an access to the link to kind of see that particular page of your project. Now, the third example of data is status reviews. A lot of companies, most companies, will spend their time in the projects taking the Excel data, it's going to really where they live out of Excel. And they will then do screen captures into a PowerPoint. Okay, They'll spend hours tidying up the PowerPoint. It could be 50 to 100 pages long. And then they'll do their briefing every month uh, with the management team. So you can see where they are. So the idea here is that if you want to really present data to the management team, you have to spend the labor to convert it into a static format and then present. This will be kind of this example here. Now, I think a little bit better, it takes a bit of time to kind of set up, but then it's going to pay you back over time every week or every month, is to have your tool of choice, could be Jira or Confluence, whatever, uh, actually present the data to them, uh, actually be live. And then you could do kind of what ifs and look at past history, etc. And if you wanted to kind of see lists of things out of that, uh, there could be lists of uh, progress and milestones over here that could be exported in Confluence to a kind of a Confluence page. It could be an issues list, maybe kind of uh, down here uh, that comes beca becomes a text output in a Confluence page, even like a risk list. So by keeping the data live in these tools and linking them together, you can quickly find things and then avoid the whole cycle of going from Excel uh, to PowerPoint. Now, if you love PowerPoint, and you're addicted to PowerPoint, and you can't save yourself in PowerPoint, then use PowerPoint. Otherwise, don't use PowerPoint. Now, number four is metrics. Metrics are very useful to kind of figure out where you stand and look for trends. Uh, but metrics can be very expensive to measure and calculate and track, particularly if you're doing it manually. So if you are taking a spreadsheet and then recording every month or every week a particular data by typing it in, Yes, you can do it and get good results out of it, uh, but it takes a lot of time to do that and very error prone. And so what I've seen people do well over the years is take a thing to track and make it a like a ticket type in like a Jira and then have Jira or the tool then track or count those over time. So if we took maybe tasks, issues, defects, risks as an example, then if they become items to track in a tool like a Jira ticket, then Jira or your tool of choice can then kind of calculate those or track them, count them, look at status, and then give you plots and trends over time. Uh, this is going to how we would do a regular burn down chart where we're looking at work complete. 
But you could then adopt that kind of idea of tracking items in a list to any item too. So a lot of clients I work with now have automated metrics, actually everything they ever want to know about is basically a Confluence page or a Jira calculation or a, a kind of a Microsoft Azure DevOps, DevSecOps, Sec, DevOps Azure, Sec, DevOps, I don't know. One of those tools, they calculate and track the data and then present it to the management team every month to kind of see how they're doing. Now you can go way beyond that point for example, a CFD diagram. Uh, if you want to look at trends over time of aggregates, it can kind of give you a kind of a picture over time of uh, totally done, uh, ready to work. And you can see these kind of lines then expand and d d go down over time too. Uh, you can also add to that a work in progress or WIP. So if you have a task become a ticket in the tool or an item that can be tracked, you can then track its uh, delay point uh, how many in a particular state are building up and then kind of figure out what, what the work in progress or the backlog would be uh, for a particular area of the workflow. So again, the more you can put in things as trackable items in a list and then maybe kind of change the label of the list like risks, issues and the tasks, uh, then you can really kind of do some very clever uh, metrics and prediction uh, by looking at the tool data. So number five are the quality checks you can put into the workflow and even embed them in there into the software. So maybe beforehand you had a very manual way to do this. Now you have a workflow defined in a tool uh, like the workflow here going to left to right. You can identify when and where particular checks should be put in place and they may actually occur at these uh, transition boundaries and they can either be manual you ask questions and verify things, or there can be then an automated response you give to the uh, tool. So for example, uh, an, an easy manual version is where you add a point like this, these points here, and you refer back to a checklist in Confluence or SharePoint manually to, as a reminder of what has to take place between maybe this point here and this kind of point here. Again, that's just a way to kind of quickly make an accessible uh, reference point or checklist as you go between state one and state two. Uh, I've seen people gonna use Google Forms. The Google Form is a, a presentation of a series of questions you can put together out of the checklist. And if you answer the questions correctly or you say yes to things or whatever, and your colleagues uh, approve that, then you'll be ready to go from kind of point A to kind of point B. Now we can get fancier than that. Uh, there are all kinds of controls you can put into the tool sets too. Now I'm, I'm going to refer to a Jira example here, but other tools have the same things. Uh, validator basically is a software uh, configuration uh, point in the workflow where you can say stop here and don't allow you to go from this point here to this point here unless that certain conditions have actually taken place. So if you look at the the technical kind of user guide to these tools, you may find some quality control controls you can put in place uh, that are basically help you remind the team of things to kind of look at. You could also have uh, fillable templates and uh, validated uh, entries. So if you're in a proposal phase or a planning phase or a risk management phase or a decision phase in the tool, you actually could make sure the templates it's going to put a data into, like the decision and the alternatives have been checked out correctly. And then when they've been entered correctly or entered at all, then you can go to the next step. I've even known people to have the data of a form sent to a manager or a supervisor or a tech lead. He or she kind of checks out what happened and they get back with somebody and they can go to the next step. So there are ways to kind of take the output of the individual and then kind of share that with other people, get them to approve it or check it out and then allow the person to then transition between maybe A, B or B to C. Now, number six is traceability. So traceability means you're able to prove that particular things have been done and there's a good paper trail, digital trail, uh, things actually have been done. So for example, if you are a software engineer and you are gonna code requirement number one or requirement number two, then a trace matrix would tell you that, yeah, I put that requirement in this particular code area so I can find it. I do have for sure uh, test criteria defined. So yes, I have that. And I have a test result I can then show people to prove that requirement one got done. So if I didn't have this table, 
then it may be tempting to say, well, I'm sure it's been done, or I guess it's been done, or I hope it's been done, but really no way to prove it or remind yourself it's been done. So the trace matrix is a good way to at least track where things are, what state they're going to be in, and at the end, kind of prove things have been done correctly before you then deliver uh, to the customer. Those matrices are actually pretty difficult to maintain over time. They can get become they can become very big and very cumbersome. Now, if we look about how we can then use the data in a tool flow, these items in the red circles actually exist in the tool. Like a requirement exists as maybe a backlog item or a confluence item. A test case could be then a piece of text that defines a test case, either linked to the requirement or linked another tool to the requirement. Most tools offer the ability to kind of have uh, subtasks or tasks or task breakdown. Uh, so that's kind of there for you too. If you then submit code to a tool like Geared or Subversion, uh, you can link the requirement number or ID uh, back down to the code uh, commit. So that's kind of linked for you too. It could even, even be committed uh, through a task ID too. So either a requirement ID or a task ID. Um, people have to do both or either. And then the test results will be the final uh, pass or fail uh, that you can then store. And then if you have things like designs or design notes, uh, that could also be linked from a requirement or maybe a larger system requirement over to a confluence page. And there you would see the picture of the design, the design notes and the and maybe interfaces. So all this stuff here still exists, but then is kind of embedded in the tool flow. So when the developer or the tester is at a particular area of their project, uh, maybe they're a particular part of the part of the code, they can quickly find in the tool and the screen they're actually at now, kind of where the task was for that, uh, where the requirement was, etc., and the code result. I mentioned at the beginning, I do track a list of tools that people are going to use. It is not the most complete list on the planet, uh, but it's actually a fairly good list, I think. If you go to a Tools to Consider page, then as I run into companies that use different types of tools uh, for different purposes, Purpi purposes, purposes, then I make a note in the web page. Now, tools and vendor names do change a lot. So maybe uh, Doors Today is by IBM, and then Doors Tomorrow is by somebody else with a different name. So do keep in mind that I can't possibly keep up with the names of companies that they change. So just kind of Google the words and then see if you can figure out what, no, what is the uh, related company or the new company name. And then if you think about it, just send me an email and I'll be, be happy to update my list. Again. In summary, look at the information your team manages and where in your workflow and tool suite that would best fit. Thanks for watching this video. For more help on these and similar topics, please see the videos on the channel. The video over here is a list of 27 practices you might find very useful for your team. And over here is a video that will help you find defects earlier in your workflow. Please feel free to post a question below.